welcome to this session all about um, the newly enhanced audience spectrum profiling tool. Um, really lovely to see lots of people here and some people joining us. I'm just going to play for a little bit of time um, while some more people are, are joining us. We've got quite a lot of people signed up for today. Um, yes, I'm Anne Torajani. I am the CEO of the Audience Agency and it's really nice to say welcome to so many of you. And it's really lovely to see lots of old faces or lots of old names as well as some new ones. Um, and in a moment, I'll just talk us through what we're going to be doing for the rest of this 90 minute session. Um, by the way, I'll just do a quick description. Um, as I say, I'm Anne. Um, I'm the sort of middle-aged, late middle-aged woman with uh, glasses on, a green top and uh, reddish hair. Um, and if you have any other access needs, by the way, there are there is captioning and there's also live audio description. Uh, use the keys at the bottom to access that. If you need any help with this or anything else access wise during the session, do please uh, message my colleague Adam in the chat. Um, as I say, we are recording this session. Hopefully we'll be able to use some of the clips to share some of the news about audience spectrum with others as and when they join us. Right, so without more ado, let's skip in to what we're going to do for this session. Okay, Ollie, can I invite you to skip us on? So this session is um, it's going to be me uh, telling you a little bit about Audience Spectrum and uh, the, the new tool that we have for profiling our audiences and indeed for profiling the population. So I'll give you a little introduction to Audience Spectrum, especially the new enhanced version of Audience Spectrum, why we did it, what's new about it and so on. Um, in this session, we are assuming some prior knowledge of Audience Spectrum, so we're not going into lots of detail about how it was built uh, in the first place and so on. We're assuming that um, this is a, a largely a coalition of people who are quite well informed, but please do feel free to ask us questions if some of those things aren't clear. So we'll do a quick introduction. Why? why now, what's new, etc. Then I'm going to hand over to Oliver Mantel, our Director of Evidence, to talk about some of the uses of um, the new enhanced audience spectrum. Um, in particular, we're going to be focusing in on just looking at overall audiences, um, showing change, showing change over time, comparing different groups, and then looking at some of the geographic um, uses of audience spectrum, particularly the new enhanced version of it. Now, those of you who are experienced audience spectrum users will know that there's a lot of other uses besides, and we're hoping that we can come on to some of your questions about that in the final section, where we just do a quick introduction to do about how you can access it, where, where it's available, what's coming up next. But mostly, last half an hour, we would really love to hear what you have to say, answer your questions, because I'm sure that's where interesting things will happen. So if you've got a question as we go through, please do feel free to drop it into the chat. What we'll probably do is to take some clarifying questions as we go through, but save the meatier ones. How could I use it for? Uh, what about X or Y? Um, we might save those for that last session at the end. And please feel free, as I say, to drop a question in the chat or please do use the hands up functions. If you'd like to come on and speak your question, uh, we'd love to hear from you as well. Hope that's all clear so far. Uh, do please introduce yourselves to other people in the chat if you'd like to, just so everybody can see who's here. Um, and without more ado, I think I'm now going to dive in. So far, so good all making sense. So new audience spectrum. So just to remind everybody, audience spectrum is a segmentation of the UK population, um, really based on their cultural habits. And importantly, it's geolocatable. So we can see in which postcodes people with tendencies to do to have interest in different kinds of culture actually live. There are 10 segments altogether in Audience Spectrum. And originally we built the first version of Audience Spectrum, I think around about, I think we were launching it around about, about nearly, nearly eight, eight, nine years ago. So we've now decided with so much more data at our fingertips than we had in the first place to give it a really good refresh. So one of the things that we heard from all of our users is they wanted much greater granularity. If you're using Audience Spectrum, in a very practical way, you'll know that actually it's really useful to have some differentiation, some, some more detail. So one of the reasons we were we have made these updates is on, on your request to provide some greater granularity. 
Secondly, um, we really notice we work, we work with literally hundreds of organizations on the audience spectrum every year. And one of the things that we discovered is that for some organizations in particular parts of the country or for particular kinds of uh, work, we'll find that they have you know, just one or two um, dominant segments and it's useful for them to have more um, detail uh, in, 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 uh, for, for, to help in their work. We also know that people are much more used to using um, segmentation in their work. Uh, it's much become much more prevalent in the way that we develop audiences and uh, market culture in general. And so actually we wanted to have a tool that was um, more able to fit around your own segmentation as well. And I think there's lots of um, good new benefits uh, in the enhanced version of audience spectrum will help you to do that. And of course, there've been lots of changes in the environment, in particularly in audience behaviors. Obviously lots of that have been quite COVID driven and, uh, and some of the changes that we've seen post COVID also have affected how we've built um, uh, some, some of the observations in the, in the segmentation. And of course, there's also been changes in what culture is available and so on. And um, we've also learned an awful lot over the past decade of using, using audience spectrum, particularly working really closely with organizations. So we've got a better idea now of how people really use it. And that's been uppermost in our minds if we thought about rebuilding. Yeah, um, I, there's a question from Joan Nankaro here saying, what is granularity? I have to say, it's one of those words that I overuse with great uh, enthusiasm, but it is a bit of a, it's a bit of a buzzwordy jargon, isn't it? But granularity, in other words, there are more grains in it. So it just basically more detail. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, um, keep, keep us on, on, on track. Um, and yeah, so we've had, we now sit on these amazing, we look after these amazing huge data sets now about audiences all over the country that we derive from a number of different ways from the Audience Finder program that some of you will be involved in. We have literally millions of records telling us what um, audiences do around the country. And we wanted to make sure we were folding back a lot of that intel and new knowledge into the enhanced version of Audience Spectrum. So there's some of that in there as well. We've also been doing, we've got this millions of survey responses, I think it is, it is, it is over a million survey responses to the audience finder survey question, which tells us to think about things like motivations and so on. So again, a really big data set there. And we wanted to make sure that all the value of that was folded back into audience spectrum too. And we also have got some new, it's some interesting new data sets at our fingertips. So we've always used the Department for Culture, Media and Sports um, taking part survey as an important layer in the segmentation. But we've now got things like um, the cultural participation monitor, which is the population survey we've been running since 2020. We now have a really important new source of data there, which is very much more about sort of how audiences are feeling about things right now. And the idea is that we can try and fold some of that more current information into audience spectrum too. So that's the kind of the, the why and the why now thinking. Um, Ollie, please, if you, could you keep an eye on the chat? If anybody's asking us for any clarifying questions as we go through, would you just flag those to me? So do please put your questions um, in, in there. And Ollie can just flag those to me and I'll do the same for him in a moment. So to move on, what next? There is, in fact, a question right there, ah, um, okay. which is, is there an audience spectrum classifier tool so where you can put a list of postcodes and see the second breakdown of that data set? Would you like to answer that, Ollie, while we're there? <laughs> um, yes, why not? Um, so certainly at present, there isn't a kind of external place you can just drop data like that, but you can do profiling through us if you come to us, which is a, a paid for service. Or if you're putting data through something like Audience Finder, it's there available for free. Yeah, so there's there's not some of it. We've we've always been a little bit resistant to just dumping postcodes into a profiler on the grounds that it's quite important to know which postcodes you're looking at and how relevant they are. Um, but so so actually, but if you're an audience finder, you do get automatic um, profiling of your uh, all of your data. So that's the that's the way that we do that. Um, so that's a that's a it's, it's a it's a good question though. And by the way, if you've got suggestions and things that you, you'd like the sound of, or you'd like more of, or you'd like less of, please, this is a really great chance to let us know about those things as well as we go. Right, Ollie, next slide, please. Um, so what are the new sub-segments? Sub, sub so one of the really important uh, new aspects of um, audience spectrum, we wanted to add that extra layer of detail. And we ummed and ahmed for ages about just adding some new segments to the existing ones, and then decided for the sake of managing to maintain the known framework of audience spectrum that many, many of us are used to using, the easiest thing to do would be to take the existing 10 um, segments and simply split those into two. So there's some other segmentation systems that work in a similar way. So we now have 10 um, top line 
uh, segments that are all now split into two subsegments as per that nicely simple diagram there. And the way in which we did the split was based primarily on engagement levels and booking behavior. So we've audience spectrum always looks at the that you know is a sort of a is graded from super engagers at one end of the spectrum to people that very rarely engage at the other, and they are listed one to ten in that way. Um, and we've continued to do that for these subsegments. So actually, they're split. So segment one will be the slightly more more engaged of the two subsegments in each case. Um, there are also significant differences between each of the subsegments. Um, geography is another key aspect, and we'll see that as we look at, actually look at some of the segments themselves. Um, the demographics are different between the two segments as subsegments. That's an important uh, qualifier as well. And also, as I say, we have drawn out particular factors that we know you find uh, particularly useful and interesting, like the kind of things that people might be interested in doing and so on. So we've also drawn out things which are particular points of interest in terms of the practical uses of um, audience spectrum. Ollie, would you say that's a hierarchy? Those that, that's, we, that, that was the way in which we prioritise the breakdown of segments? Yes, so obviously our, our, priority, our priority is always about cultural engagement, which is obviously how they were initially defined. Um, but yes, some of the other factors come in, particularly for segments where there's lower levels of engagement, some of those other factors come into play more. Whereas obviously there's lots of engagement we can differentiate between not only levels but also types of things people are doing so some segments doing a lot more in terms of family events and, and others do more in terms of maybe more traditional um sitting down culture as they're called brilliant yeah thank you just things it's just useful to understand you know how the how you know when you're looking if you're used to looking at the 10 segments you suddenly go up on these new segment sub segments it's really useful to understand uh, the basis on which they have been subbed or divided basically so engagement levels first, but then these other factors come in um, uh, further down the chain. OK, next slide. So what's new? As we've just said, um, the, the layer of subsegments um, is important. And of course, this is uh, really about being able to differentiate more between different kinds of audiences, particularly if you're an area that's dominated by one or two uh, types or indeed that that's that, that, that they dominate your audience in particular and um, we've also thought quite a lot about how people use audience spectrum as I've said and thought quite a lot about the practical applications of it so we've been thinking more about well how might we change our actions to support or to be of interest to people uh, in different different groups and we've also thought quite a lot about enhancing the resources that we make available to you to use now we're, we're only part way through that process at the moment so we're now building up uh, a lot of resources as I'll we'll explain later on so if you've got things that you would find particularly useful and interesting in terms of support resources around this do please let us know um, and as we've said uh, we also know there are a number of themes that have become particularly important we've already mentioned you know significant changes to audience behavior that have been driven by um, uh, lockdown and covid uh, digital engagement of course has changed quite radically in the time that uh, you know since we've been using audience spectrum we were very keen to try to demonstrate some of those um, uh, to, to, to reflect some of those kind of key themes uh, the different you know big, big trends and tra changes in how audiences behave next one Holly so you'll see specifically in the way that um, uh, audience spectrum looks that we've updated the icons so it's a little bit easier to work out which one's which we have importantly completely renamed two of the top level segments so what used to be called Facebook families slightly misleadingly it turned out over time uh, because Facebook has turned out to be quite a middle class sport I understand and Facebook families, families aren't particularly so we've now renamed Facebook families to frontline families and I believe that one of the key factors in doing that is that a lot of people in that group are actually frontline workers of one kind or another and also perhaps you know very much you know perhaps really badly affected by cost of living crisis and so on so we've called that group more accurately I believe frontline families and the other group we've renamed is another um, less engaged group that was formerly called Heydays, which had this whiff of older people around it, which we've now um, renamed supported communities, particularly because the Heydays, we always have this issue that in the Heydays groupings, which uh, the Heydays group rather, which actually includes a lot of people that are living in um, supported supported living, whether that's living in care or um, living in um, 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 sort of a sort of community living one way or another but it also included lots of younger people as well so you've got this real split between quite young uh, young people and and pe people who are older people in care 
So now we've given that a better name, sports, sported communities, which again is sort of more accurately says what's really going on there. You'll see that we've revamped the presentation of the pen portraits and hopefully made it a little bit easier to navigate, especially with, with more um, detail in there. And um, we've expanded it, as I said. So each of the 10 segments, as you know, has two sub segments and they're very easily renamed just M1 and M2 for Metro Culturals, S1 and S2 for supported communities, just to keep it simple. So we haven't got a proliferation of, of kind of crazy names. Ollie, are we nearly there? I think we are. Next slide, please. Oh, I think I need to have to say importantly, just to reassure you. So therefore, you know, you will still recognize most of the names. Uh, it shouldn't come as a horrible shock. We had lots of feedback from people saying, please, don't mess with the names, it makes life so difficult. So, you know, although there are some variations of borders and so on, bro broadly speaking, we've stuck, we've built on the existing structure rather than messed around with it. And just to spell out that last point, that means yeah. that anyone that was in one of the existing top tier segments is still in that segment. Um, Thank you, important. So, so people, ha people haven't moved between top tier segments, we've only subdivided within those segments. Exactly. So it shouldn't, come as an, it shouldn't make, it won't make inaccurate work that you already have ongoing. Okay, great. Thank you. So here they are. I, you'll be glad to know that I am not going to walk you through all of the segments. Um, you know, some important things, as we know, Metroculturals, particularly if you're in a large urban centre brackets, particularly if you're in London, Metroculturals are enormously um, important audience. Um, it's worth saying that there are some differences, partic particularly between these this, this, these, these are super, super, super engagers, but there are some quite interesting differences between the sort of older and more established professional elites and this kind of a, a younger group of uh, more metropolitan kind of professionals with, with some significant different, different preferences and habits in terms of culture. Um, again, very an important group for some of us. Uh, quite a lot of people's audiences will be dominated either by community land culture buffs or by experience seekers. Community land and culture buffs being that sort of older, uh, quite affluent, uh, leafy suburbs kind of audience. But here we see that, that there's a big difference between sort of suburban and urban audiences, which should be quite interesting. And again, that younger experience seekers group, really important because they're a bit of a signifier about what tomorrow's audiences might look like. Um, we've sort of split again. It's, I think, quite a lot of this by age. So you've got a slightly older, more midlife, uh, Kind of millennials uh, grouping uh, under under E1, with, whereas E2 are still the, are, are very much in that sort of younger backpacking, still studenty kind of kind of grouping. So quite important again in terms of behaviours and and uh, likely interests. Moving on to our middle engage group. So those are the high engage groups. Here are the middle engage groups. Some of you will have um, audiences very much dominated by dormitory dependables, and I know my colleague Catherine, who spends a lot of time with organisations, is thrilled that she's not showing people uh, now saying oh you've got a lot of dormitory dependables um, she's able to give people um, some clues about some differences between that that large group so dormitory dependables um, you know sort of qu quite interesting culture not necessarily hugely adventurous but again we're seeing some differences between the the more um, uh, kind of uh, you know more suburban dormitory dependables slightly different habits perhaps from those who are living uh, much further away from big cities so that's an interesting one there trips and treats a, a family audience again Again, really interesting two different kinds of family groupings there really and uh, similarly home and heritage can, can be a very large group for some, pe for some people uh, again geography quite an important signifier for those differences between home and heritage I believe and um, lots to look at here as you know I, you can see I'm whisking through this very very quickly but what I'm suggesting is that um, I'm hoping this is a taster and encouraging you a small breadcrumb trail uh, towards going having a look at some of this stuff um, on the on the website and, and getting to grips with it and if you've got questions, this is much more interesting to hear from you what's interesting rather than me um, ran, you know, rambling on at you. So um, again, the less engaged groups, uh, four of those split out, two different names here, the frontline families and supported communities, as we've said. Um, some interesting differences there that we're going to have a look at, I think particularly close to creativity, Ollie will be talking about in a moment, very importantly in London, this is a very dominant group for quite a lot of organisations, so um, important here for us to have split those out. Um, as I say, uh, again, really interestingly, we've seen this, this is helping us to understand quite a lot about the different makeup, both demographically, but also in terms of cultural interests. So flipping on then to, I think this is our last slide, just looking what the country looks like, I believe. So if we're profiling um, 
our the nation using audience spectrum this is what it looks like uh, essentially you can see that um that they do break down quite well so that actually we're getting good coverage of each of the groups uh, across the country only anything you'd want to comment on there about just the the the, the national profile i guess to note that although it's splitting most groups roughly speaking into half some of the groups um some of the subgroups are bigger than others um which is worth being yeah. conscious of and we talked about uh, well, you talked about that supported communities little group of much younger people and you can see that that's the kind of two percent on the far right end there um so most of that segment is, is still it's as well it's a lot of people substantial minority so, yeah. yeah really important to say so so and don't forget although we're looking at a national profile here you can be looking at these overall profiles for regions you, you, the town you live in you know so you can look at this this kind of the overall picture you can look at for any area come and talk to us about how to do that okay i think i'm going on Ollie, you can i can see you about I, I, to say something. <laughs> I was i was just going to give a little plug to our place event just to say that we are of course yes. doing that for various different places around the country as well as part of that ongoing series but yeah that's right actually so we've been doing a series of a, of um so-called place events where we're looking at you know what is the background population of this area looks like what does that mean for the way organizations might work together if you're interested in us coming to your area to do that let us know because we're, we're we're following the interest as it were on that one okay uh and that's free by the way i think that's subsidized by the that's uh, fully funded by the arts council so I, when i say that i mean it's like you know call us rather than 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 pay us okay so um i think we're now going to move on um i'm going to check i'm going to keep my eye on questions if there's anything you'd like clarifying but we're going to keep um, moving on so that we can get to a property conversation at the end of this and i'm going to hand over to ollie who's really going to think about how can we apply this these new enhanced version of um, audience spectrum great thank you um so yes i i thought it would be useful for us to talk through um, a few different examples to kind of look at different ways of um where the subsegments might kind of add granularity as previously mentioned add um add nuance add, add extra kind of insights and, and information to what we're looking at and i've picked a few different examples that are deliberately quite different from each other um there by no means everything that can be done with them but i thought it would at least give a bit of a sense of range um so we'll partly be looking at applying the segments to um, survey data um, to ticketing data to population data of various sorts uh, at different scales um, but also looking at different ways of differentiating between let's say different programs or different venues uh, looking at change over time looking at uh, overall sweeps of large areas looking at how to really sort of if you like differentiate it smaller areas where there's been you know it's previously been a bit, a bit trickier to do that um so we would also of course love to hear from you as and when that you, know, you have examples that where you've used it so you know do please anyone um, either obviously today if anyone's really ahead of the curve or uh, later on please do share with us um, what you found and what you've seen so to start with the first example i'm going to pick um is one which is um an organisation which is very dear to my heart, being very based um, based locally, and indeed my first employer, uh, Sheffield Museums. And for this example, we looked because um, Sheffield Museums have a had a great track, of, track record of collecting lots of audience finder survey data. Um, they've got a really big pool of data to have a look at. So um, we use that to look at some of the survey data, and particularly to zoom in on one of the um, segments. So a big chunk of Sheffield Museum's audience is experience seekers. Um, one in five of their visitors, roughly speaking, um, which means that that segment is big enough that it's kind of, it's, it's usable, but there's room to differentiate within it. Um, so what we did is we tagged the survey responses with the audience spectrum types and then kind of did some various analysis based on that. Now, from that, we could see that there were some substantial differences between the subsegments that sat underneath the overall experience seeker. Um, label and I know there are at least a few Sheffielders in the room who will will recognize some of the dynamics going on here so um, as Anne mentioned broadly speaking under experience seekers we've got the kind of a mix between um, the slightly older um, E1 group and the slightly kind of uh, younger earlier career or still student uh, E2 group and when we started to look at what that meant in terms of the audience uh, for Sheffield Museums, uh, a few different things came out. So, typically speaking, um, the across the different sites that the museums have, they have um, 
the Western Park Museum, which is kind of a city museum with a strong kind of family angle uh, outside the centre. There's the Graves Art Gallery, which is a kind of um, visual art space, which sort of up at the top of the library. So it takes a, you, know, you have to go up a few stairs or take the lift to get to that one. Um, but then there's the Millennium Gallery, which is a really kind of big, popular um, through fair uh, near the station and Kellam Island Museum um, as part of the, the recent merger with Sheffield Industrial Museums Trust and Museum Sheffield. Um, and what we found was that the E1 group, the older group, um, who again was slightly more settled into life in the city maybe, um, were more likely to be previous visitors. They've probably been around a bit longer in the city, they've had more chance to see things, they've probably got more of a, um, an ongoing engagement with the kind of city and its history and you know they're more likely to have families and they're more likely to be taking those to things like Western Park Museum. Um, so we saw a bit of a skew towards previous visitors amongst that group whereas the E2 group were much more likely to be new visitors. And if they had been, they were recent new visitors. They were, they were fewer people saying, we've been before, but it was five years ago. It was very much sort of on the new around. Um, similarly, who they attend with varies. So both groups were quite like, both types rather, were both likely to attend in groups. So they're likely to attend with other people, but those groups skewed towards attending with children for E1 and attending with other adults for E2. Um, and interestingly, Although E1 are more likely to have been to the Graves Art Gallery, E2 are more likely to attend in groups there. Um, so again, it's, it suggests maybe a bit of a shift where uh, maybe people are exploring together with friends as opposed to um, sort of, I don't know, maybe long-term habitual visitors making these kind of solo trips. Um, so we saw that kind of very much a difference in behavior. Um, and linked to that, we saw quite a difference in terms of where people lived. So we could separate out between local and non-local um, members of experience seekers. So we looked just at Sheffield postcodes and within those there was quite a heavy concentration uh, in the E1 group in um, areas of S6, S7 and S8 which are kind of um, uh, middle-class suburbs, lots of families um, arranged around the centre of the city. Um, whereas the other group um, with more students there were lots in the centre and in S10 again near um, Hallam and Sheffield University. Um, so, you know, very much linked to that kind of profile in terms of being students or graduates. So what that gives us within this wider, yeah, and really key group, the experience seekers, a real sense that there is differentiation in terms of motivations, in terms of interest, in terms of content they're interested, where they live, what they do. Um, and therefore, with targeted promotions or targeting particular offers to people, um, there are different places to look, different places to go, um, different things they might be looking for. Um, and all of those can be targeted just that little bit sharper um, by using the second tier down. Um, I know that um, Gemma from um, Sheffield Museums is here. So maybe if this comes up again in, in the chat and we have a Q&A later, if people have questions, then um, I'm sure Gemma will be uh, more of an authority than me in terms of some of these things. Um, but yes, so that was a little overview um, in terms of this use. Uh, for Sheffield Museums. Our next example um, is Chichester Festival Theatre. So here, although obviously um, using ticketing data, we normally get these huge transfers of um, the data to analyse, we've really zoomed in on one particular factor. So here we're looking just again at one particular segment and its subsegments and what's changed. But in this instance, we're looking at what's changed over time. Um, so, just a festival theatre, for those um, who don't know, is based on the south coast um, and well, it's a very large venue, um, very, quite, quite a broad reach, um, but typically speaking, as per most non-London venues, Metroculturals are, you know, they're not insignificant, but they're not a huge part of the audience because they're so concentrated in London. Um, so typically you'd see maybe sort of, you know, three, four percent of the audience being metroculturals. Um, and that was the case um, pre-COVID. Pre now, the, the story that we've seen play out in lots of different ways through the population monitor, through analysing um, various different venues data, um, is that there was a shift during COVID in terms of the mixture of people who were most comfortable attending or most frequently. Um, and typically we saw that people being really highly engaged, urban-based, and being young were three of the key factors that tended to drive attendance up. And sure enough, uh, with Metroculturals, 
often fitting a lot of that profile, um, particularly in terms of high, high engagement, high attendance, um, they tended to spike in terms of proportion of engagement during the pandemic. Not in absolute numbers, but in terms of within the mix of people attending, that went up substantially. Um, and indeed, it did here for Chichester. Um, so that far is not very surprising. Um, we would expect to see it. We did see it. All good. What I think is potentially a bit more interesting once we can look at these subsegments is to see the pattern that played out between those two subsegments. So, as Anne mentioned, you've got sort of the older, uh, more established, um, more affluent M1 group, the younger um, M2 group, sort of earlier in career, etc. And typically, the M1 would attend more than M2. And that indeed was the case before. Um, so that roughly double the proportion of the um, attenders were from M1 than M2. And both of these groups grew during COVID. So they both, they both went up, they both followed the same kind of pattern. Um, they're both highly engaged, they're both urban, makes sense. But notably, the M2 group grew faster. So from being about half the proportion, it ended up even, even higher than the M1 group in terms of the mix of people attending. Um, and although it's fallen away again a bit, in, as, a, as a wider range of people have been going out and um, engaging, you can still see you know, the levels are, are relatively uh, relatively elevated. We'll see how that plays out um, over time as the other segments come through. Um, but this, this kind of flip between the prominence of the two subsegments tells us something interesting about that particular moment in time and who is prepared to, to do what and engage where. And the thing I think that makes it really stark um, is if you look at the whole list of 20 subsegments, the M2 um, subsegment was the third lowest in 1819 and it was the third highest in 2021. So it really shot up in terms of relative prominence because of that period. Now, of course, we're hoping that um, the kind of extreme peak of um, COVID that we've seen um, in recent years, hopefully isn't going to recur to quite the same, to quite the same degree. Um, but hopefully this is illustrative that in a wide range of other contexts where you see really substantial change and variation in programming in the same opening a new venue or trying something really radically different you might see bigger changes among subsegments than you see among segments overall or you might see very particular subsegments responding and you may be able to see patterns in terms of which subsegments all respond in the same way and um, to give more clues about which audiences are reacting to what um, so that's kind of an, an illustration really about how a particular moment in time can see changes in particular subsegments seen a couple of things in the chat is there anything um worth flagging Anne? nothing i've seen recently um uh, uh, that's particularly relevant to this but ollie all right that's fine that's fine okay um yeah so that was our second example um so we're taking a little bit of a tour around the country um we're going to up north again uh well not just up north but we're going to um look at this um if you like buzzword uh, leveling up uh, which we've obviously heard loads about and you know that's affecting transport infrastructure and all sorts of bits of the economy, um, but it's also also linked to culture. And every local authority in the country has been allocated against one of three kind of categories of priority in terms of leveling up. So there's category one, which is high priority, two medium priority, and three, you guessed it, lower priority. Um, and we can see where all of these are across the country. So you know, large patches of Wales across the north, um, the, the borders, um, either side of the borders, um, and indeed the Welsh, uh, Welsh, the Kentish coast, um, are all kind of in these high priority areas. Um, large swathes of the south, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, are in the lower priority band. And if we look at the population in each of those three tiers, unsurprisingly, Yes, there's lots of variety because lots of different people live in lots of different places, but broadly speaking, there are more people in lower engaged or typically lower engaged segments in the high priority areas than there are in the low priority areas. And this is probably one of those things you think, well, that's that's incredibly obvious. Um, it's really, yeah, it's not that surprising, it's not that interesting, but I would agree. What I think is more interesting 
is when we start looking at that really properly split out, uh, looking at these subsegments. So here we have the proportion of people in each subsegment within each of those three bands. So just to take an example, looking at the far left, Metrocultural's M1, there's a very, very small proportion of them in the high priority areas, as you'd expect. Um, there's slightly more, but still not loads in the medium priority. And then there's slightly more, um, but um, really not that much more in the lowest priority area. So you see those kind of three little bars on the left. And that same picture is then repeated across the whole, the whole chart. So you can see there's quite a variety going on. But most interestingly, if we zoom in, looking at lower engaged groups, we see an odd pattern amongst these two groups in particular. So that's what we're going to zoom in on, the up our street and frontline families. So, though we've seen a broad pattern towards lower engaged groups being more represented in the priority areas, hence these solid bars being highest compared to the sort of hatched and pale ones, um, there's a substantial difference between the subsegments. So up our street, is split into two groups, one which tends to be a bit more middle aged, more like kind of semis on the edge of town, and the other one which is more like older terraces and flats in sort of more built up areas. And of those two, the latter is much more likely to be overrepresented in levelling up areas. So there's a really big concentration. Um, for the U1 group, they're really only marginally overrepresented at all compared to category two of the kind of medium priority. They're massively overrepresented um, for, the, for the older group. The flip side of that is that the frontline families, um, the younger group who tend to be you know, more financially hard pressed and to be younger, they tend to be either new families or couples sort of heading towards starting families, as opposed to the kind of older, slightly more established um, families. It's the younger group who are much more overrepresented um, amongst the levelling up areas. So if you're looking to programme work in these areas in particular, or you're trying to understand behaviours in these areas in particular, it's more helpful to be looking at the subsegments and see the very particular behaviours and interests and patterns and comms preferences and um, profile and so forth of the subsegments, rather than just looking at the aggregate kind of, this is what our street in general are like, because these subsegments are much more over represented in that particular area. So hopefully that's all, that all makes sense. So that's the levelling up example. Um, I'm now going to zoom back down the other end of the country um, and to look at London in particular. And although I'm looking at London, this will apply in different ways to other places, but we have known from lots of conversations with people um, using Audience Spectrum that um, audience spectrum at the top tier in London were, has created some particular challenges that have, have necessitated some sort of various creative responses in the past in terms of different ways to break down the segments to kind of get more granularity. And the reason for that is this. If we look at the overall audience spectrum profile, the top tier for London, 75% of the population are in those three um, key so Clyde's Great Creativity, Metroculturals, Experience Seekers. We're getting on for a third in each of those top two. Um, which obviously then makes it quite difficult to be granular with that unless you start introducing other factors. Um, it also means that the picture across the whole of London when you apply that gets a little bit um, less nuanced than perhaps we would want. So what we're looking at here is just zooming in on the kaleidoscope creativity and looking at how, looking at the two subtypes of that, of that particular segment gives us a more nuanced picture of London as a whole. And we're doing that um, in this instance by looking at the profile of the boroughs. Of course, again, all of this information can be looked at by, by region, by um, local authority or borough, by uh, ward by postcode sector, whatever. But in this instance, we'll, we'll stick to something nice and clear uh, at the borough level. So, just to explain what will, on the face of it, look like a sort of slightly complex chart. Um, it's not as bad as it looks, I promise. 
Um, broadly speaking, we've put every borough in London on this one chart, and the higher up they are on this one axis, the higher the proportion of kaleidoscope creativity there are within that borough overall. So you can see Newham is far and away the highest with getting on at something like 67% uh, within kaleidoscope creativity. Um, and right at the bottom end, uh, you can see Havering down there with very few indeed, about 3%. So they're sort of stretched out on that dimension. We've also then stretched them out on the opposite dimension, which is to say, of the kaleidoscope creativity that are in that borough, are, they, are there more of them who tend to be in K1, or are there more of them that tend to be in K2? So the more extreme the balance between those, the further away from that central line they'll be. So you can see here, for example, um, Kensington and Chelsea has relatively few kaleidoscope creativity at all. When it does have them, they're overwhelmingly going to be the K1 type. Whereas if you look at Hillingdon in the middle on the right, you can see that actually there's a slightly higher proportion of them getting on for a third, um, but they're very predominantly um, the K2 type. Um, so you can sort of see different types of places have different balances within the kaleidoscope creativity as well as different volumes of them overall. Now, the third dimension we've, put, we've played into this is to highlight the places where kaleidoscope creativity is the dominant segment. So it's, it's the biggest single top tier segment for that borough. And those are oh. the dark dots. Um, and then the, the medium dots are where it's still quite a big part. You know, it's at least half of the um, whatever the highest one is. And then there's all the others where it's not such a, not such a big deal. Um, so this is where, um, if you want to, it's your bets about where each of the um, London boroughs are. Now, so now's your chance to kind of predict your local, local one if you're a Londoner. Um, and this is how it works out. So what we see is there's a really big cluster in the top right here. So generally speaking, if a borough has more kaleidoscope creativity than anything else, and really high levels of kaleidoscope creativity, generally speaking, it's the K2 type. If there are, uh, the only exception to that, in fact, is Lewisham, which is the only place where, which has um, more kaleidoscope creativity than any other segment, but they skew the other way, and it's very marginal. It's pretty close to the center line there. Um, then we have a couple of other little, little groupings. Um, so in the east and south of the center of London, we've got this pocket of sort of Hackney, Lambeth, Tower Hamlet, Southwark, um, where they're more likely to be the K1 group, um, but it's not the single largest group. In fact, there's lots of metroculturals around this, this particular area. Um, and then conversely, Haringey, Merton, Barnet, um, skew the other way. And then we've got quite a swathe elsewhere. Um, but you can see that in some of these areas, there's really very few of the K2 types, even though there aren't that many um, classical creativity overall. So that, that's the kind of, you know, Westminster, Hammersmith, Kensington, et cetera. Oh, Ollie, um, we've just had a question from Bella uh, who said, just, can you just remind us what kaleidoscope creativity as, a, as an overall segment are like? So very particular, uh, very, very urban um, segment appears in lots of big cities and? Um, yes, so um, they have a tendency to be more diverse in terms of ethnicities. There's a tendency to be uh, a little bit younger than average, but often um, so I mean, in a way, it's, it's kind of, it's the sum of these two subgroups here. So you do get kind of pockets of, um, you know, people who've lived in particular places for quite a long time, but also then you have these kind of um, sort of younger singles, particularly um, in um, often, it, it could be council blocks or it could be sort of rented um, accommodation. Um, so it's a bit of a mix, but a strong urban scheme. And, and I think importantly, you know, they're, they're a very important um, grouping for, you know, this is a, this is a, a type, um, uh, a profile that appears in the audiences of quite a lot of organisations in, in large areas and actually quite important in terms of sort of um, perhaps the social objectives to kind of be, to be more accessible to, to a broader audience. So they're kind of an interesting group from that point of view. Um, the very, you know, in particular, we see lots of kaleidoscope creatives that, that um, coming to outdoor arts events, those kinds of things, uh, local festivals and so on. So that just to give you a bit of flavour, thank you. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Ollie. There you go. In that sense, of... um, I'm always, always conscious when I talk about, you know, particularly about London audiences. There's lots of my colleagues actually that live and breathe it, um, as opposed to visiting occasionally. Um, so um, the other thing to say actually about that group is that we've seen some quite interesting patterns in terms of digital engagement. Um, some of the online engagement that they've behaved 
a little bit more like um, some of the other highly engaged groups um, or some of the higher engaged groups um, through those channels. So often they're often not engaging with the kind of subsidized art sector, but are engaging in other ways potentially. Um, so yeah, I think there's all sorts of interesting, interesting things about this group. Um, so much as I love a scatter plot, um, I, I've, I've been led to believe that other people find other ways of visualizing stuff a little bit uh, more straightforward. So let's just see where all these different groups are geographically. So these are the same categories we talked about before. So the bold ones are the, are the darkest, um, the palest ones, obviously the ones that were at the bottom. Um, and what we can see is very much a strong inner outer London split. So more of the K1s in the inner London, more of the um, K2s in the outer London. Um, but there's also clearly quite a strong east-west gradient as well, particularly the center. So we get these kind of quite striking stripes, which is why Lewisham stuck out as that kind of real exception, um, because it's on the eastern end of that kind of central, central grouping, and indeed very, very close to that central line. Um, what we also see is that once you get a certain distance out of central London, the proportion of this group drops very highly anyway. So there's many fewer in the southwest, there's many fewer in the east. Um, you get much more into the kind of suburban um, suburban segments if you go out that way. Nonetheless, we can see this kind of swirl around the outside of really sort of high concentration um, of um, that kind of the K2 group, the kind of younger, younger group there. So um, what this would hopefully give us is, is a sort of a more varied sense of the geography of the place. So, you know, we've done where it's worked in London for, for years, but I think even so, I think once we saw this visualised, it, it started to give a nice, nice sort of impression about what was going on with these segments. And we could do the equivalent thing for different places or different segments indeed, even in the same place. So that's a range of these different examples um hopefully showing that you can do all sorts of different things with it um, and pick up different aspects of how people are uh, engaging or who they are or where they are or, or, or so forth so um that was that from me um yes as I, as I said before we would love to hear your examples as and when you've had more of a chance to um, to would. And, and actually, Ollie, um, I think that uh, Jonathan from uh, the Pound and Caution has uh, raised a really important question, which is to say, I love all this, you know, whizzy data, scatter oh, etc. But how does this actually help me sell tickets? So um, this is a really good question, Jonathan, and one we should uh, definitely address. Now, there are a, a number of different ways that we can think about that. But I'm going to say that's a really great kickoff Q&A question. So I'm going to just finish up here and then we're going to come back to that question because I think there are quite, I mean, there, there are things to do with how does audience spectrum in general help us sell tickets, of course, but it's also how does the enhanced new version with all the new subsegments, how does it help us to do that better, I guess, it's one of the questions. So I'm going to throw that back. I'm going to have a stab. I'm going to throw that back at Ollie. I'm going to ask Catherine, my colleague, um, and indeed anybody else, some thoughts about how this might help us to do that better in future. But just quickly, while I before I do, I'm just going to quickly run through. Great, the segments are there. How do I get my hands on them? So obviously, if you're working with us, you can expect to be able to ask to um, use that extra layer. So you know, we do work with lots of organisations in quite a hands-on way as part of our bespoke consultancy and research work. So obviously, um, you will find the uh, the, the uh, segments are all there and available to you when you are working with us. But you'll also find that they are now in Audience Find Answers. That's the free. Um, audience data tool if you have any uh, if you have ticketing data or you'd like to join our free survey um, you can automatically be able to see your um, audience spectrum uh, enhanced audience spectrum profiles in the audience find answers part of the application which is the sort of is the new bit so it's not in the old graphs and charts which are under audience find or original but you've got but it will be coming soon uh, to those parts of the of the program as well but if we can if you'd like to have a look at that we can you either do ask somebody in our audience finder team to take you through that or if you have some questions we can talk about that now um there's a couple of very specific questions I see coming up on you about what you've just been talking about. We'll come back to those. So uh, just to finish off here, though. So, yes, you will find it in Audience Find Answers. Um, it'll be in some more of the graphs and charts as time goes on over the next few months. You will also find it fully integrated. You can commission an area profile report. So if you want to look at the background population of your area, 
uh, you can commission that and you will now find that all the new subsegments are in that. And um, there are a variety of different kinds of APRs. There's a sort of very simple, straightforward one about looks at your area, just, just known as a, 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 an area profile report. There's an area profile report plus, which gives you um, quite a lot of access to more um, background data. And then there are some specialist area profile reports, which are looking at um, particular kinds of audiences. Uh, and in particular, um, if you're trying to engage uh, non-engaging audiences basically so those are known as the the um, engagement uh, area profile reports so um, all the subsegments are all in there and that's a that's a really interesting tool if you want to understand better who lives in your area can I just um, throw in yes of course thing just about the enhanced version of those is that they yep. have the um, subsegment profile at the aggregate level for the area but then where it breaks down by very particular oh. local geography that's done at the top level okay Great, thank you. Um, uh, you can also know if you have a nice data set um, and it's not already in audience spectrum, uh, in audience finder rather, if you have a data set that you would like to have profiled, uh, we can profile that for you so you can understand much more about who your audience uh, overall is, who your audience for different kinds of product is, who your audience at certain times of the year are and so on. Uh, that profiling can prove super useful. And Jonathan, that helps us to get towards, okay, great. So now what do I actually uh, do with that? Um, you will find it a, a layer in all our reporting. Ollie and his team make an awful lot of data and information uh, freely available, lots of very specific reports. We've been working a lot on, on um, you know, how attitudes and uh, engagement patterns are changing post COVID, but also how people are responding to new kinds of offers and so on. Um, there's a very regular stream of new insights on our evidence is an insight part of our website so you'll find the new enhanced audience spectrum groups giving out lots of more information about how they're responding to different things at the moment and you'll also find lots of information particularly the new resources and so on that we'll be putting out um, do please make sure that you are in um, you know look at our website sign up to our newsletter and uh, and if you're in audience finder very importantly you'll find lots of new information coming out through the audience finder newsletters i think i now move on my last slide is so um that's what there's there already and um, if if you many people already uh tag their um all their databases on a regular on a, on a um ongoing basis with audience spectrum uh, at the moment only the 10 pro profiles are available but later on this uh in the autumn you will be able to tag your database with the with the all new subsegments as well and um, there'll be a new mapping tool and dashboard within um well, within Audience Finder Answers, but actually that would be available to everybody to go and have a look at uh, audiences um, uh, you know, at, at a map of, of different areas and, and who lives where. Um, there will be new insights based on the uh, these, these segments coming out in Audience Finder Answers as well, for those of you who are Audience Finder users. And as you said, there'll be lots of um, interesting uh, new stuff coming out in terms of research reports and so on. Importantly, we haven't updated some aspects of it because the new census data is going to become available later on this year. And we were really keen not to update things until we actually had that new census data. Oli, did you want to just mention that in particular? Um, yes, well, I also want to make a comment just about the insights, just to make yeah. sure for those who aren't familiar with Audience Finder Answers. So the insights are essentially is the name for the particular thing you get you know a particular report or query or um piece of analysis that's built into the system so that's what those insights are so if you've got your data you can kind of say mm -hmm. show that's me fine. the profile um, for this um in terms of the census data um obviously that will be progressively coming out in 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 a you know some bits faster than others um but yes the first bit of it should be relatively soon um, and so that will allow us to update some of the um the data tables particularly uh, and, and so, so as I said, do, do please sign on to our communications if you want to um, see more and more different as it's coming out. Um, importantly, there is a tea break, which is a, a tea break is a are our regular briefings on new insights and um, they, they they pop up all the time Ollie and his team are producing new points reporting often in response to people's asking very specific questions the next tea break on the 13th of July will be taking a deep dive looking at some of the sub sub segments in a lot of detail um, I think Adam's just popped that in the chat so we can all you can all see that um, and of course it will be there always as a layer in information as we do all of our briefings because it's a really important uh, one of the important ways in which we look at uh, audiences so that's that that's us done with the a very quick introduction to what's new about audience spectrum the enhanced audience spectrum and um, uh, i think there's already some interesting questions in here but as i say i want to come back to that um, interesting challenge it's like yes i've seen the graphs 
from Jonathan, but how does it um, help me to sell some tickets? So shall we kick off with that one? I think I think there's a nice question from uh, Richard Hunt Rods down here. There's some other questions coming up. So please do feel free to add your questions and I'm going to be moderating and either trying to pick up some of those or passing on to my colleagues. So, um, Ollie, how does this yes. help if anyone sell tickets and particularly the new, the new sub-segments? Okay, so I guess it's, a range of different ways that it should be able to help you um, sell tickets. So one is about being, um, so if, for example, you're used licensing and tagging, you can be really specific about the people that you send communications to, or indeed um, frack um, who is responding to which particular communications. So, you know, if you A-B test uh, particular messages you can send out, you can then um, see whether some things work better for certain subsegments or others. Um, so that could be one sort of really specific thing you could be doing. Um, the other thing you could be using it for is to get a bit more granularity in terms of the overall offer, uh, understanding who the population are that you're targeting, and therefore, if they're one sex segment rather than another, that would imply that they're perhaps more open to certain types of product than other things, or they may prefer certain communication channels rather than others, so you have to target um, according to that. Um, so I think those would be two of the obvious things to look at. Another one is that we do see some difference in terms of how much people pay within different subsegments. So again, price sensitivity um, could come up as an issue, or um, so you might want to think about kind of pricing offers relative to different um, subsegments and how you target them, um, and indeed, therefore, how that relates to different program offers. So if you think one subsegment likes a certain type of thing but has a certain attitude to price, you might bundle those two ideas together. Whereas if another subsegment tends to like other things and have a different attitude to price, you bundle those together. If that makes sense. Yeah, so I think, so I think the, most, the most common use is either are about saying, you know, I, this, this is my understanding of who my current audience is. So if you know that uh, you're, you know, let's, for the sake of keeping it simple, but let's say so if you know that your pantomime audience is dominated by a certain um, uh, spectrum type, which you can do if you're in audience vital, or you just get some profiling done. Um, that's giving you some really good clues about how you might, who, who you need to promote to. And actually, of course, because you can then find more people of that profile in your local population, or you can find out where they live around you, um, that means you can actually expand that audience. So it's something, there's definitely something about the interplay between knowing what kinds of uh, uh, segments respond to what kinds of your programming or indeed other, other aspects of your mix and then going out and finding more of them and that's really you know that's that's that, that's really the, the level at which uh, people mostly use it i think there's definitely something developmental about understanding who is in your hinterland who's in your catchment area and to some extent understanding where you may need to um change the offer itself if you're going to reach those people so that's a you know that that's a more fundamental thing than selling tickets from a from something that's already programmed and again i think that's probably one of the most common uses that we see of, of audience spectrum which is thinking about how you know people generally use it catherine i don't know if you'd add anything to that about you know you very front line, you know, you work with a lot of organizations. What, what, what's your thought, your thought on that? Um, I think quite a lot of it's been said. I think, I think actually particularly for some of the groups, it's useful in getting the differentiation between whether we're talking about a family market or not, because it's quite a split in some groups like dormitory dependables. So I think, I think that's one particularly useful area that's broken down and especially for, for groups like kaleidoscope creativity some of the less engaged groups and talking about um community engagement really understanding um the differences different perspectives um there with it within within those groups as well to just get that more nuanced view in what can be actually really big groups within a local area to try and to try and understand and target um yeah but uh, I think, that's, I think that's spot on. So let me just say, so please do, if you've got questions, comments, thoughts, please do pop them in the, the chat. We're looking, we're, we're now all on it. Um, and there's some, there's some great questions coming up already. Um, but if you would just like to speak, just put your hands up and please just, just join us. I don't, wh whatever form you want to talk to us in, I think that's absolutely great. Now, I just wanted to go back. Um, Richard, actually, it wasn't so much a question, just, Richard was just talking about how he, um, how he uses, uh, how AKA use uh, the profiles, uh, but mixed up with some other data as well, which makes it really useful. So sometimes, I, I, you know, I, I don't know if that's your team does that, Richard, or whether um, that's that's our team doing that. But I think you you very very kindly offered up anyone wants to talk about how to do it. Uh, you put your, your address there, which is really nice of you. And um, we had this earlier question from Max uh, from Maxime, who was asking about whether when you were talking about digital audiences, um, Ollie, about whether or not they were. 
uh, in-person audiences or digital audiences too. Of course, one of the, the challenges is that we, we mostly use postcodes to determine someone's some, someone's um, uh, audience spectrum profile. And um, so actually it's not so easy to do that, but in fact, uh, and, uh, as, I, as I pointed out, so these are in-person audiences that we were talking about for Chichester. But of course the other um, important point is to say that in the cultural participation monitor, we've been able to see by, by doing um, a survey of the whole population and looking at their audience spectrum profile, we've been able to see what people say they're doing in terms of online engagement which has been a kind of really useful revelation and we put in quite a lot of that thinking around how digital behaviors are different across the different subsegments into the new stuff as well which i think is a really important new dimension as we're trying to think about navigating our way around um, hybrid offers anything you'd add about digital audiences as i find some new questions down here she touched on the um question about um digital and chichester um I did actually get a message from Caroline uh, from Chichester um, saying that they, and they've had a, you know, since we were talking about it, they've had a little sort of delve into their own um, data and noticed that actually they think it was particularly actually some of the online stuff that was being put through the box office that was picking up all those metroculturals. So that's interesting. So that would explain the kind of shift of geography and the appeal towards a digital audience um, is what's bringing some of those segments through, particularly the younger ones. So yeah, just to clarify that. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, so really practical question here, which I think is a dead useful one. Dan says, how quick and easy is it to profile a data set? So e.g. If, if you do a series of data events, is it free and is it quick? So if it's data you've got in Audience Finder, um, you can um, profile it as, as, a, as a full year data set. You can also use um, the show sets tool, which is practically instantaneous. Um, but um, it's, that's not free, I can't remember the cost, but it's really quite low. Someone else, one of my colleagues might remember the exact numbers, um, but essentially you pay money to activate a certain set of records to be able to analyze. And once you've done that, you can analyze them as much as you like um, for no extra cost. Um, so that would be one way of doing it. If you want to come to us for profiling, that's the link that I've just shared. There you are, a penny a ticket. Um, thanks, Jenny. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, if you so the profiling, the other route is the link that I've just shared, um, where there's a fixed cost per overall profile. Um, so that would be one way of doing it. If there's a whole load of things you want to do, then it might be worth having a conversation rather than doing lots of individual profiles that way. Um, so the quickest and easiest way is to have it is to be to put your data into audience finder and then you get all this stuff um pretty automatically as, as we said yeah. um it but doing that is quite quick and easy you just phone up our um uh and free uh, just phone up our, our uh, um audience finder line and they'll they, they can connect you essentially um to keep to oversimplify there a little bit anyway right One caveat on that is at the moment it Audience Finder has the overall insight built in. And obviously, as we continue to develop new insights, that will have more um, flexibility within it. Um, so just to kind of be, be super clear on that one. This is a great question from Matthew, who says, uh, like in my building, I, I, many other places, massive amount of new housing being built in Milton Keynes. Um, how nimble is the segmentation able, with, uh, able to be with regards to new people moving into the local area? So particularly, I mean, you know, East London, for example, that kind of the, the Thames Gateway, for example, lots of big population changes happening. It's Preston and stuff as well. Um, I think this might be the Matthew that we're having a chat to about doing a place event covering Milton Keynes um, in the not too distant, well, in the mod not too different future. Um, the household directory that we use to tag things to um, addresses to um, audience spectrum is updated every year. So um, essentially, the yeah, so any changes to that basic background information will be picked up by um, Experian through an enormous range of sources, and then that will then feed in. Um, obviously, the the shift once the census data gets in, gets incorporated will be a kind of like a bigger adjustment, um, and obviously that'll be quite soon. Um, but yes, it does continually iterate. So it, it's, you know, it, does, it doesn't lag to that extent. Because we didn't take you through an entire how is audience finder built, it's worth saying that what, you know, one of the things we do is we license an ex a, a, um, a kind of household directory from Experian, the big sort of data giant, um, which they keep updated all the time with lots of different sources of information in it. So that, that's always feeding through into, into audience spectrum. So you do get sort of fresh up to the minute um, information. Good question from Owen here from WNO saying, do you think the overarching segments will still hold 
or do you think they're more valuable to concentrate and combine different subsegments for targeting? Interesting one that I suspect, because I, I mean, I, I quite often find myself using the sort of like what I call the mega segments, the sort of high, medium, low engage, but you know, because I'm quite often just talking about, you know, these kind of core thought lines in the way that different people engage with the arts in general. So I think it all depends the level of detail that you're working with and, and what you know about whether you can see those levels of detail in your audiences. But um, Catherine, Ollie, would you a, a more detailed response to that? Um, shall I go first and then Catherine follow? Um, so um, I suspect, again, yes, it will depend on context. It might be that if you've got high concentrations of particular top level segments, you really want to zoom in um, on the sub segments to get the granularity. Um, there may be, because as well as, so Anne's mentioned the kind of those three bands, high, medium, low, but I often find that there's kind of other patterns across sets of the top tier that also things tend to go together in certain contexts. And I suspect we'll start to see, and we haven't been using this enough live to have got, you know, seen all of this yet, um, but we'll start to see certain subsegments that also tend to kind of go hand in hand. So it might be we start to see, oh, there's a cluster of three or four of these that actually, for the particular, this particular art form, they're particularly predominant or, or otherwise. So I suspect it'll be a, a bit of both. I think I'm the top tap, the top level still works. It still does, you know, what it says on the tin and what, what it has been doing for years and what's been working for people. Um, and it may be there's just one particular segment that you really want to have the split in. So it might be you sort of keep things at a top level, but then zoom in on particular bits. Um, that might be a, a solution. And we have flagged particularly that um, supported communities. There's a particularly big difference between those two sub segments. Sub -segments. So that is one where if you were focusing on that area, then having that split in place is probably really very useful. That'll be my, my view. Um, just to add to that, the thing that sort of springs to mind for me is is around the kind of split between the more con more mainstream and more challenging product within organisations. And I think um, I just, you know, instantly, Owen, um, from your perspective there, thinking about the classical music sector um, as well and how useful that's going to be in really understanding um, how to target those different types of products better. And obviously over time, we're going to build up much more of um, a picture of you know, who's, like, who's most likely to attend what in, in a much more nuanced way. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. I, th I think it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that that um, the more, you know, you, you, you know your data really well. And I think it's that, it's that you know, um, audience spectrum is just one of many different filters that you can put across it and I think it's worth saying you know that actually um, it is about the interplay between what you know about your local audiences it's it's an it's another layer you know I think I really like it you know I think I think every organization needs their own segmentation really don't forget audience spectrum is a, it's a segmentation of the population it's not necessarily the most important way of segmenting your audiences it can bring something interesting to what you know but you might also know that you know you have in your in, you know in your, your database you've got people who are Clydescape creatives uh, because of you can know, based on where they live but you know that these are the people that always come to the panto and they and that they don't come to anything else now that's another layer that you then put in in terms of your own segmentation you know but what you know about your audiences and I think we really when we're working hands-on with organizations we're always encouraging them you know it's it's one layer it's like put the other stuff into it if you can so that's why that's one of the reasons it's really useful to have um uh, you know to do tagging of your of your of your your own database so that you can build that into that layering as you as you um, see things changing over time and um, i think it's also worth saying that some of these conversations about how we're using it um are really i'm hoping we've got our new online community where we're starting to have conversations about how people are using audience finder data but also how they're using um audience spectrum and so on um, i would, really would encourage you if this is something interesting particularly to hear about case studies what people are actually doing uh to join that community i think that's very easy to do through our website or through the audience finder the website right have we got any other questions i see some people are going thank you very much i love that and i'm off now so um last chance of anything anyone wants to ask any last questions and then we might say we shall um invite you to come back and talk to us some more about about uh that there's that next tea break and various other opportunities any more questions anybody or observations Yes, we will be sharing the presentation um, and we'll, we'll share a link to the community where we'll put the, um, the presentation um, and obviously that will also then be a place where people can comment, have other suggestions, chats, um, 
if she had her own. Their own yeah, thoughts. we'll we'll send you that. And, and actually, I think the other thing that we're really interested to hear about is if you think that particular resources or ways of using this would be useful, could you just please give us a heads up? Anything that would be helpful to you, uh, we really like to know about it. So just just uh, just drop us a note. That that is the best way I think to be in dialogue uh, is that through that community. Partly, not least, because our support team are on it all the time, and it's a good way to talk to them about about wanting individual things as well. So, listen, thank you all. So go on, Holly. I was just also going to, in relation to that, if there's things that people are particularly curious about, they want to hear about on that event on the 13th, um, there may be time to turn, turn around some, some new new analysis for that yes, as well. It's so. worth saying, isn't it? Those two breaks are a chance. If you've got things that you would like to know about that are sitting in any of the data sets that we are um, proud and honoured to be the uh, custodians of, tell us, and, 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 and it's your team's job to, to drag it out, right? So, yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Anyway, listen, thank you all a lot and um, take care. We'll send you some follow up stuff and thank you so much a lot for coming along. Tell us what you need. Okay. Yes, thanks a lot.